the way we do it with remote viewing, you're given not coordinates, but a set of numbers that are associated with a place that someone else has determined, and then you drop into that location. It's quite fascinating. It's very fun. A lot of my students now use it to help them find things. In 2027, we have coming in this new era, the rave children that will want to speak more telepathically. And they're gonna be vegans. They're not gonna to wanna to eat all this animal product. They're gonna be much healthier. We are no longer going to be ruled by our emotions as much. Welcome to our next episode. Today, we're gonna to talk about some really interesting topics like human design, remote viewing, about this new children that are coming in 2027 and much more. I have my beautiful sister here, Celeste. So wonderful to have you. Celeste is a soul alignment guide. She's a teacher of many modalities such as human design, mediumship, remote viewing, shamanic journeying, and much more. Celeste, I know this has been a long journey for you of connecting to your beautiful gifts. You are talented and very telepathic in many ways. You and I started years ago where you approached me and asked to activate your light language, but you were already a medium and you worked very closely with entities. So tell us more about kind of your journey. Is this something you were always connected to and you were medium since you were a kid? How did it start opening up for you? First of all, I want to say thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I love that line in that movie. I can't remember the name of the movie now when he says, I talk to dead people. I used to love saying that to people. <laughs> it was a joke, but all children are born with the ability. And I want to say this because it hurts my heart when people tell me I could never do that. Each and every person has the ability to connect with their higher self, with their guides, with spirits that have crossed over. Every single person has this ability. We are all born with these gifts. Most children shut them down around the age of seven to nine because they're not practiced. They're not encouraged. In my case, they're actually frowned upon. When I was nine years old, my parents brought home a Catholic priest to do an exorcism on me because it was of the devil and I was going to go to hell for it. So as you can imagine, that was a little scary as a nine-year-old child. That must have been um, very difficult. How did yeah. you deal with that? Did you understand what was happening? or just you Well, I didn't. It? When I look back on it now, I didn't. I just remember being afraid. We were a very strong Catholic family. And I just remember hearing that all the time. You're going to go to hell. And I was like, what? I couldn't understand. So... It took a while, but I remember struggling with the little boy that used to hide in my closet that I would play with all the time and mm -hmm. the man upstairs in the attic and people in the stores. And I would just in my head be like, no, stop talking to me. You're not there. Just trying to shut them out. Eventually, I did shut out seeing them and hearing them as much. But one thing I seemed to never be able to shut out was feeling them. No matter what, I could always walk into a room and right away I would know the energy of the room, whether there were spirits there that were angry or happy, or I could always feel the energy of the room. That would never go away. When I had my children and especially my daughter, and I saw how in tune they were as children, I didn't want my kids to ever feel the way I did. So that is when I started to open up more and try to understand it more and reconnect. So pretty much it's been my whole entire life, just certain aspects of that have been shut down and dormant for a little while. What about mediumship to the dead people? You just got more comfortable in allowing them to come through your body? When my kids, when I started to see what their gifts were, I wanted to reconnect because I wanted to be able to help them to understand it. For instance, my daughter, if you ask her when my dad died, she would say when I was around five. My father died when she was 18 months old, but he spent every day with her after that. I would walk by her room and I would see her talking to him and I would see him out of the corner of my eye. I would hear them interacting with her favorite storybook. He was always there with her. So in her mind, he didn't pass till she was around five when she started going to school and started not paying attention to him as much. That was like very 
beautiful and fascinating to me because I could still see and feel my dad there interacting with my kids, especially her. So I didn't go deep. This was really just about me because in this time, I was still struggling to heal through a lot of things from my past that I didn't quite understand. I don't want to get into all that, but we all have our journey that we come here and walk. And I was trying to understand that world and get it back and also understand everything that I went through and how to heal through it and become a better person and a better mother. As they were growing, I could read them and it was hard because like they would lie to me or tell me different story and I would know it was different. And it really made me feel like I was crazy hearing them tell me that I was wrong, but I knew I was right. And then finding out later that I was right. Does that make sense? It's like, it was, it was a struggle. It was a struggle. And I think when it comes to soul communication, I think today in general, it, things are becoming more accepted. We have podcasts like this on YouTube and many others putting information out. And I think we are lucky to finally be living in a society where meditation is something that's almost like mainstream and yoga. There's much more connection. But I know those of us who kind of started on this path earlier, it was hard because we didn't have the support. We didn't have the community and the teachers so that's the advantage of these times and whoever listens to it, know that you always support it. You always have someone to reach out. And if, if things and the gifts are opening up for you, you should definitely seek that community. So f for you, Celeste, as you started channeling, connecting, I know remote viewing is something that you also teach. And I took your wonderful workshop last year. Remote viewing was something I started doing naturally, but I always wanted to learn the military tactics of how to do it. How did that come into your life and you became a teacher? But tell us more about remote viewing and why remote viewing is another one of those modalities so that it's very helpful for anyone opening up to their connection with the higher self and, and their surroundings because we able to travel much more than in the physical way. Yes, absolutely. I love remote viewing. I was introduced to it when I lived in San Diego from a friend of mine. And he taught it to me. He taught a class at the church that I was going to. And I fell in love with it right away. And I actually clicked. I was really good at it. <laughs> And I did some amazing remotes with him personally that were really fun to do. I was astonished at the results that I got. And then when I moved here, I took a couple more. When I moved back to Utah, I took a couple of more classes because I loved it so much. And then I wanted to share it with everyone else. So I began teaching it. And in the beginning, the first few years, I taught it just like the military. I taught it the way I was taught. Now I still show you that way because there are so many groups out there that use remote viewing and you can join them and help do remote views. But if you don't follow the certain guidelines, they won't take your view. Explain remote view into those who are just tuning in and they're like, what are you talking about? What is remote view? I like to describe it as literally dropping in to a time and a place and receiving vacation. It's putting yourself in a meditative state and allowing yourself to drop in to a certain time and place that you want to. And it can be a time and place that you choose or like the way we do it with remote viewing, you're given not coordinates, but a set of numbers that are associated with a place that someone else has determined. And then you drop into that location. It's quite fascinating. It's very fun. A lot of my students now use it to help them find things when they lose things. Mm -hmm. They'll tune into these abilities and use it to try to drop in to see where this item is, which is fun. I started getting curious about is when someone got lost. It was a fortune event that happened in Nepal and a friend's husband disappeared and everyone was looking for him. And that's when I was like, I'm sure there's another way to maybe tap into his location. So I reached out to different remote viewing communities and I was asking, trying to get different pieces of information. Unfortunately, he was never found. I still think he's uh, somewhat alive from my remote viewing but we'll never know. It's a really interesting technique. So it was used in the 70s, right, by the military, especially when we were in war with Russia and during the whole Cold War. I, I'm a really big fan of Monroe Institute and Robert Monroe's work in general. I, I yes. do I mean, sync meditations every morning. He created, I feel, in some ways, this program without knowing it's going to be used for military later to be able to 
dropping really deeply and go to these different planes where that information exists. So yes, the idea of the time and space constructs and therefore everything is in singularity. So you can move through time and space and obtain information. And it's been used for eons. This is what's fascinating. Maybe six years after I learned how to do remote viewing, I did a past life regression with a woman who was very well known for it, knew nothing about me and did my past life regression and brought up a time when I was remote viewing during the Druid era. And what she said that I was one viewing? of the original. What were you remote viewing in it, the Druid era? The Emerald Tablets. Oh, interesting. And I was trying to help them know where the armies were for the wars, all the war, the religious wars that were going on. And it was fascinating me that she brought that up because I had such a connection to it when I first saw it. And our past lives always come back around. <laughs> of course. What's fascinating to me also is that I used to always want to teleport. That used to be one of the things I'd always say, if a portal opened up, I tell my kids all the time, if a portal opens up, you know, I'm jumping in it. You know this about me. There's no question. I'm going in it. I've always just, wanted to do this teleportation kind of thing. And in one of my meditations in the pyramid, actually, I was told you're already doing it when you remote view. So I was like, oh, that makes sense. It's you not like what you're thinking about less. the physical. Yeah, I love that. We always think it's like a physical A to B linear thing, but it can be much more multidimensional. And our soul is one that can travel theoretically. It's not bided by these contracts that we have here in this consensus reality. You mentioned teleporting. What about telepathy? How is telepathy connected to remote view? And like you, I've been excited about teleportation. And it's almost like I feel it's like innate knowing that it's coming or maybe has happened in other ancient civilizations and advanced civilizations that are beyond Earth where we have been doing it. Being a highest priestess in one of the temples, Saqqara Temple in Egypt, we did have a portal where other beings were manifesting themselves in and out. So it's not something that we just saw in the movie. It's something that I think innately as a soul we have been doing or we've been the facilitators of that experience. And we just wait for that to happen again. I see it happening for us, like in Star Trek in the future. Perhaps telepathy is something that will happen sooner. Like with light language, it's something we're already doing as well. We're starting to channel these high frequencies. We're starting to communicate in a beautiful, coherent way where words in English and unnecessary. Tell us about telepathy and tell us about this new era that's coming from like human design perspective that fascinating about where is humanity going from now to 2027? We're just going to ascend higher and higher. Our vibration is just going to continue to evolve and our DNA is going to continue to just expound. We did do it in the past, and there are many people that still do it. Now, I want you to think about how many times you've thought about someone and all of a sudden your phone rings and they're calling you. That's true. That is telepathy. It is a minor little detail, but it's the beginnings of it. The only thing is what happens then? You answer, oh, that was just a coincidence. No, you are connected. And a lot of the work that I do is human design, is, which if you're not familiar with human design, look it up. It is very fascinating. And if you want to know more, please feel free to reach out. I love doing sessions with people around human design. But I am a reflector in human design. We're called the unicorns. They're 1% of society are reflectors. Michael Jackson was a reflector too, right? Yeah. I believe so, yes. So he was hiding in Neverland because you guys, your charts are completely open. So you guys yes. have kind of like sponges to all the yeah, And when you don't understand it, you just take on the weight of the world. Literally, you take on the weight of mm -hmm. the world if you don't understand it and you don't learn how to protect yourself, so to speak. But more fascinating is that even with my mediumship, I get messages, right? I talk to dead people. I get feelings. I know things that are coming up. It's part of my life. 
one of the things that has always been a given with me is I can walk by someone and know they're pregnant and know if it's a boy or girl. Somebody tells me somebody's pregnant right away. I know if it's a boy or girl, like that child is speaking to me, which they do. This is a form of telepathy. And then I started tuning in and paying attention more to the children around me because children were always attracted to me. I go into a store and kids just stare at me. That soul gaze, right? Because they know. And then I started to realize they'll talk to me. So there are many children, if they're under seven especially, that will still speak telepathically and say things to me. The animals. Oh, animals, yes. Animals, absolutely. The Trees. Yeah. Trees talk to us all the time. Plants. I used to have this flower that if I walked by and didn't say good morning, I could feel it calling me back, yelling at me. They all, they're all living things and they speak to us. It's just we have to fine tune our receptors, that soul communication, so that we can listen to it and hear it. That's all it is. But all of us can do it. And we're going into a system right now. We just hit the age of Aquarius that we've just come into. It started years ago, but this is the huge shift in the way the energies are going to be felt and used and accepted now. In 2027, through human design, we have what we have calling in coming in this new era, shall we say, of children, the rave children that will mostly speak, will want to speak more telepathically. And they're going to be vegans. They're not going to want to eat all this animal product. They're going to be much healthier. They're going to come in with that attunement and they're not going to want to let it go. It's not going to be us trying to help them hold on to it. They're going to be saying, forget you, I'm holding on to it. <laughs> what kind of energy type will they be in human design? Are they going to be more like- It's still going to be, reflectors? it's still, yes, it's still going to have all of those, most of them. I can't tell you all of the complete logistics. Some people, they know everything to what's going to happen. And I love listening to them. But some of the things that I've heard, we're going to move to a nine chakra system, an 11 chakra system. We're in the nine now. Most people only focus on seven, but in human design, we follow nine. In 2027, it's going to move to an 11 chakra system. So that's going to change it up a little bit. I'm also told the emotional solar plexus, which 50% of society has, they have this emotional authority where they have to ride this wave of emotions. That's going to be gone. Children being born will no longer have this emotional authority. So that tells me that we are no longer going to be ruled by our emotions as much. Is it going to be more body centered? What else is going to give us authority then? If not, You like still have the other authorities, just not the emotional one. You will still have, that is your authority. That's what you have. But yeah. those coming in about will know. Children. Right. Very stuff. interesting that Ra, who created the human design system, he received a lot of this information from some downloads, star beings, this information about 2027. And then it's going to be this complete different frequency bandwidth that we step into, which aligns with everything that we already receive right now, that we are in this transitionary year this year, next year into this new blueprint that's being created in 2026, 2027, just even based on kind of the, the year cycle we in, right? Yeah. Year eight, and then next year is going to be year nine, which is completion. And then the first year of new cycle it just makes sense for humanity and where we're going. I had some interaction with hybrid children. Do you think from all the remote view and information you've been receiving, is there a time perhaps that these other, I would say, some sort of like alien beings that are also waiting to come and be part of the society that we're going to develop? I personally feel like we're definitely going to start seeing more and more of that. A lot of people ask me about this thing that happened in Miami. I've been looking into that too. For me personally, what I try to explain to people is like with my mediumship class, I do healing circles, right? And I let people come in. It's a modern day seance. We shut all the lights off. We call in spirit. We talk to spirit. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times there are certain people that'll come in. They'll be like, please don't call in any aliens. Because a lot of times my alien guides will come in or other people and they're afraid. And I'm like, you got to get over this because for me, they're always here. 
And for me, what happened in Miami, when I feel into it, it wasn't that someone opened up a portal and they walked out. It's that the vibration was extra strong for some reason. It was vibrating really high, which almost made the pixels change so that we were matching another timeline and now they could be seen. That's right. Does that make sense? It's That's like they're always I, there walking around, but now yeah. this time they could be seen. Most so we talked a little bit about that with some of my friends. And I think the information we've been receiving also is that like Miami is within that Bermuda Triangle mm -hmm. corner. A friend had an experience seeing a ship in a distance also in Miami region, which is close to that mall. So I feel there is definitely also a phenomenon there specifically where maybe the veil is a little thinner. And I'm totally with you because the way I looked at that information, I listened to Elizabeth April and tuned in, saw the same thing, that they were as surprised <laughs> yeah. that this happened. <laughs> yeah. As we were, They're like, we always walk <laughs> around and nothing happens. And now like, people are freaking out. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> That's, I think, the vibration that you're saying, like, of the earth changing. The earth is moving through this platonic belt. And I think everything is changing rapidly and accelerating. That's for sure. People are working on themselves. They're changing their vibration. They always tell people when I'm working with people, especially if I'm working with someone in a family unit, how often have you heard, I'm afraid to leave them behind? And I'm like, no, your job is to do everything you can to align your vibration to the highest possible. That's what's going to help people come up. That's what's going to help more people come up and step into this vibration, not staying down at their level. You stay down at their level, you're just keeping it low. That's a very good point, Celeste. That's my take on it as well. It is hard because those who step in on this journey often lose friends. You have to be okay with that, that you are going to keep on going. And some people just won't be able to relate to you because your vibration has changed or it triggers them and they're just too comfortable in their sandboxes. I think ultimately we have to listen to our soul, go back into our past lives, whatever it takes to really reconnect with ourselves. First, it has to be that divine union within and really listening to what our soul wants. We are here on a journey of earth school. We have to get through some levels, but the fear is what holds everyone back. Everything is on our side of fear and attachment. What prevents people to move forward is their families or friends and attachment is a real thing, but... I think the more someone is able to let go, the easier it will be all around. And letting go on all levels. I feel yes. like it's a perpetual lesson. How much deeper can you surrender? How much more can you let go? <laughs> Whatever is coming, this uncharted territory we're in. I think it's going to be amazing because as it is now, it's, it's so fascinating to me when kids talk to me. And sometimes they'll even say like, why can't my mommy hear me like this? And I have to try to explain it to them. And I, yeah. I don't know. I just hope they stay open. That is my thing right now. I work with so many families that have kids and I take a $10 copay, which is what their insurance would be, just because I want them to stay open. And I don't want them to get conditioned by all this mess. Yeah, <laughs> beautiful. If you had a client that comes with a child, they don't understand the child. How do you usually help the child to understand what's happening for them? I just honestly talk to them about exactly what they're seeing and feeling and what's going on. Like when parents or... call me and tell me that they think their kids, they think there's, if your kids tell you there's something in their room, there's something in their room. Mm. Trust them. Kids are not programmed to lie to you and make up stories like that. Mm. If they're telling you that there's something under their bed or there's something in their closet, there is. Mm. Just because you can't see it, there really is. When, pe when people want me to go do a house clearing or something to help them, I'm like, I have to talk to your child because it's that child's responsibility. It's their journey. They have to own it. They have to tell them to leave. They have to tell them they're not. It's empowering that child to know that they have everything they need inside of them. That, that's really powerful versus being told, oh, you have an invisible friend and and go play with your invisible friend or completely this or stop them. playing with your invisible friends and for me too like i've been very much encouraging my children to open up to light language and which is our divine right in soul communication so before even telepathy like there is a step before maybe and and, and it's amazing to see how easy it was for them to step into it as long as like the parents gave the permission slip 
like the parent held the space for it. But I'm also noticing my kid was so into it. And now as he's like turning 11, was definitely more hesitancy. And some of it is the condition probably like, mom, just let's do this, but not next to the school. Or like before he would come out of school and kind of go into it now, there's definitely that like what a, others will think about me or how am I being presented. In some ways can wait to create these like new earth schools, like these magic no. schools for these children where they will thrive and expand in their gifts versus being afraid because someone might misunderstand them. We'll have to create that for them as well. It's not an easy one, but I've heard some schools are slowly being created. And perhaps with this new RAFE children, it will be like almost a necessity because they won't be able to sit in their regular school environment. No. <laughs> oh, no. It, you know, th that's a whole nother category. Even back then, I knew I wanted to homeschool my kids. I just couldn't do it because I had to work. I, I definitely would have much rather my kids been homeschooled than gone to public schools that are literally created to dumb them down because they're geniuses before they hit school. <laughs> Creative and yeah, yes, that, that is true. The they genius. think outside the box. I explore and being more in nature versus like in this little like boxes behind a desk and forced to write. They, and, and this is what I'm seeing a lot of these like ADHD children like mine. They try to classify, and I always been telling them it's not hyperactivity; it's really attention dial to higher dimensions. Yes, <laughs> they go. <laughs> they just they're just not interested in the present. They just kind of in a different frequency bandwidth, especially these newbies. When you want to tune in, who has children, and it takes that type of patience, but also challenge yourself to go out of the box and. See, maybe there's something there that you just don't understand. And maybe that's an opening for you to explore as well. Yes. And accept them as they are. Also tendency right now to question gender. So one of my stepchildren was a girl and now is in this like middle ground, you know, what they call unbinary, which is very interesting because I went really deep into understanding that. And it feels like these children going to challenge that even more, that status quo of the gender neutrality. And some of it is a trend. Don't get me wrong. Like I feel some children pick it because everyone else is doing it. With my child, it was very conscious choice. And I actually saw my child really stepping into self-love by choosing to be who they truly are. I agree with you. I do feel like it's anything will have your trendy people. Anything that happens will have that. <laughs> Look at most of our alien guides and friends. They're binary. Yeah, hold on. We all they <laughs> That present to me as they have the aspects of them that they show me that feel feminine or masculine, but they don't present as one or the other. You know what I'm saying? So I definitely think that we're going to end up moving more towards that not being such an issue. Definitely when I think of Pleiadian beings and some other beings I interacted with, very clear. I watched the other day of Alexander the Great, the whole history, and he too, there was no such thing as homosexual. It was just sexual. So you could go either direction. So I feel we categorized and grouped our understanding of our way of being by the society, these norms, by the Roman Empire. I was going to say, you're going to get me on another soapbox tangent here because that's all religions. That's yeah. That all happened when religions came into play yeah. and started controlling us. Right. That's all. <laughs> I'm peeling and removing these layers of conditions and what religion told us we're supposed to be, how we should be looking like, or the calendar that we should follow. Like I just started embracing like other new calendars. On Wednesday, we've been recording this, the day of Mercury, which is all about Ganesha and green color. I started following something different because I'm understanding now that even our language, it's all around this death culture. It's not about us thriving. We constantly saying goodbye, like bye. <laughs> like we always thinking about death versus about just being enjoying, being childlike, right? Back to innocence that we're discussing. Yeah, absolutely. Language is huge. That's why I started my flip your words, flip your life again. What is that? It's a class that I do once a week on Fridays that you can join on Zoom. But it's literally that. It's just showing people 
the power of the words that we choose to speak and think. Mm. It's like that NLP stuff. It's really just showing you that if you like saying bye is mm -hmm. final instead of saying see you soon. That's right. That's right. It, and it carries a much different vibration. They carry a much different vibration to them. When we focus the power of attraction, the law of attraction, when we focus on what we want and the vibration we want, we start seeing it more. We start experiencing it more. But we have been conditioned to focus on the negative and the finalities and depth and all of that junk. The language, I feel, definitely has been modified for us on a psychic level to, to be in that finality, as you said. So the more we open to that telepathy that we discuss and or we connect to different spaces on Earth and off Earth through by location, through remote view, the more we able to channel what our heart wants to express without the conditions and the boundaries, then the more we'll be connected, the more we will really thrive as this new society of the heart because everyone has been disconnected from the heart. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody's been living in their mind <laughs> instead of their heart space. And that is where all your answers are. Any final advice for anyone who is interested to connect with you? Tell us about the programs. I will be teaching my mediumship course again starting in March. It will be the 8th and 9th, a weekend course if someone wants to fly in and come and do the course for the weekend or if you're in the Utah area. Or you can do it online through Zoom. We meet once a week for four weeks to do it that way, to do it on Zoom. This course I developed just to help you have a different understanding of what it's like to communicate and listen to yourself and listen to your higher self. With this course, it teaches you how you hear messages because each and every one of us hears them and receives them differently. So it's just learning what that sounds like for you so that you can begin to tune into them and hear them more often. That's amazing. When there's a soul code mastery course that I've launched, which is a digital course, which I feel is very complimentary. It's more self-paced now. I'm not meeting online, but we have coaching where there is one-on-one. -on -one. And I feel that too. Like I, the more we have these type of courses to connect to all your gifts that you already have, the more you will be confident <laughs> in where we headed and knowing how to navigate these current energies. So amazing. I'm really excited, Celeste, for what's coming. Me today. too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being on this path with me, for doing your work, spreading your beautiful motherly energy, motherly human energy in Utah and beyond, and doing all the shamanic work as well that I know you do. And thank you everyone for tuning in and being here with Celeste and I, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Much love. Thanks for watching. Click on one of the videos below to see our other episodes and don't forget to subscribe.